Thanks so much. Thanks, Chandrakant. And uh, welcome, everyone, to this 26th edition of the Archives Public Lecture Series and the second that we are testing out online. Uh, this is going to be a lot of, uh, uh, it's something that we've thought about for the last few months. And I'm really grateful to Jasmine and the Blank Noise team for agreeing to uh, go with this format. And we look forward to a lot of conversations from the audience as well. Um, Many in the audience perhaps already have a sense of uh, blank noise or have heard about it uh, a second or third hand, but I uh, do hope uh, we'll have a conversation around that as well. And I'm very, very excited um, to open this conversation around the talk, which is titled Beyond Defense, The Right to Imagine. Um, I Never Ask For It, which is part of the blank noise, I Never Ask For It campaign, which the team will be telling you more about. I'm gonna get out of your way very soon. I'm just gonna give you a quick uh, biographical introduction to all the speakers and then hand it off to them. So um, I'll start with um, Jasmine Tateja. Jasmine is an artist in public service. She builds ideas for public action committed to ending violence against women, girls, and all persons. She's the founder, facilitator, or founder and facilitator of Blank Noise, which is a growing community of action sheroes, heroes, and theroes, citizens and persons, and it takes, uh, it's taking agency to end sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, Jasmine mobilizes communities to build testimonials of sexual violence, confront fear narratives, and arrest victim blame. Her practice rests on the power of collaborations and community. She's interested in empathy, building care capacity, vulnerability, defenselessness as a right, and the right to imagination. Select, uh, select projects include the I Never Ask For It project that we just mentioned and Meet to Sleep, which is an ongoing project that perhaps they will also discuss today. Um, in 2019, um, Jasmine Patheja received the prestigious Visible Award and she was awarded for socially engaged art practice. She was also recently awarded the Jane Lombard Fellowship by the Vera List Center for Art and Politics at the New School in New York City. BBC listed her as one of the 12 artists changing the world in 2019. In 2015, she received the International Award for Public Art towards the project Talk to Me, which is a project um, run by Blank Noise. Um, Jasmine is a TED speaker. She's also a TED and Ashoka Fellow. And the recent exhibition that she'll be spe speaking about, of course, are the I Never Ask for It and Me to Sleep, which were both at the Ford Foundation Gallery in New York City. She's currently an artist in residence as well at the Srishti Institute of Art, Design and Technology. She's joined um, with three members of the Blank Noise community. Um, sorry, I, one more thing I forgot to mention. Uh, Jasmine also collaborates with her grandmother, Indri. Um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the, the, the name right, uh, Indrajit Kaur, on a series of photo performances. And I would actually love to see if you have time to even talk about that. Uh, she's joined by three members of the community, Insia, is an editor based in Kolkata. She has been with Blank Noise since 2007. Abhaya has been an action shiro volunteer with Blank Noise since 2018 and joined the Blank Noise office team last month. She previously worked in the prevention of sexual harassment. And Ishita has been a Blank Noise action shiro since 2016. She was a community coordinator at Blank Noise between 2018 and April 2020. She also has a background in fashion design and development, art, and design. Jasmine, Insia, Abhaya, Ishita, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Venkat, and thank you, uh, NCBS Archives, and to everyone that is uh, watching and tuned in right now. Uh, really appreciate you taking time out uh, in a world which has really been so much about screen time and meeting less in person. And I hope that in the post-COVID world, we get to have one-on-one -on -one conversations um, in person too. Without, and I also thank you for the very generous introduction. And uh, in my in the talk, I will be sharing that uh, blank noise really has been built on the collective labor. So all of the awards and everything mentioned goes to the three and the many uh, who are sharing the panel with me and also not on the panel with me right now. Um, I will begin by sharing screen right away. Yeah. Okay. Jeez, I'll just make it bigger like this. Maybe that way. Okay. 
this okay, Venkat? Because I don't want it to play um, on its own, but yes. <clears throat> It is playing on its own. Okay. So in 2007, women on the streets of Bangalore and on the web were asked to respond to one question. The question was, is there something you don't leave home without? Responses included chili powder, safety pin, hair pin, pepper spray, helmet, some even mentioned an insect spray. This project led to, uh, or this question inquiry led to the project called the Museum uh, of Street Weapons of Defense, an online project that was uh, to spotlight the everyday reality and invisibility of fear and defense as experienced by women in their very own cities. I was in my final year uh, at Srishti Institute of Art, Design and Technology in 2003. I was new to Bangalore and um, I found myself walking with a defense wall. I find, found myself walking with my elbows out, with a death stare. I walked fast and very, very prepared. It wasn't as though I was harassed each time uh, I walked out, but there was a constant set, sense of threat that accompanied me. Um, this threat began to shape me. And in hindsight, being in a constant state of caution limited me and limits any person. Sharing my experiences of street harassment back then in 2003 with friends, peers, and classmates often yielded responses such as, it happens, men are like that. Some even said, how come it happens only to you? Of course, it was a lonely experience, but it also was something that made me notice that uh, and, become, and gradually become, or rather painfully become aware of uh, the fact that the women I knew, my classmates, were walking only in groups or had equipped themselves with a boyfriend or had just set themselves these invisible boundaries. Um, they rarely strolled or loitered by themselves. It made me notice the silence and, uh, the silence and denial surrounding uh, something that I did not have vocabulary for, street harassment. So in August 2003, uh, I was in my final year at college and I brought all the girls together into one room at Srishti. We were a small college then and uh, gave them the word public space. And I said, you know, make a mind map with the word public space. And as you can see for yourself, there were largely negative associations. Um, this gave the basis to propose that we start a conversation on on the issue, if, you know, and, and say if we've experienced discomfort, if we've experienced, if we've experienced aggression, anxiety, defense, why aren't we talking about it? Out of the 60 addressed, or the 60 who built this map, nine were willing to take this forward. This led to a three month process of workshops and um, these workshops were intimate. I was facilitating these workshops um, we questioned our silence in these workshops. We questioned why we hadn't spoken about our experiences of street harassment and abuse. We questioned our shame. We qu gave ourselves permission to remember and to release. Experiences were shared, insights were built, and there was an exhibition on campus. And I graduated. But I was deeply preoccupied with questions such as, if women are experiencing street harassment, why aren't we talking about it? As an artist, how do I engage with the public? Where do I begin? What medium? And how can this issue be an issue that belongs to everyone, where people own it and take ownership and responsibility of it? These questions informed over a decade of practice at Blank Noise. A range of participatory projects and interventions were designed to confront street harassment and the attitudes that justified it. Back in 2004, I just stumbled upon blogging. Uh, somebody said blog and I just took to it, not realizing that in sharing thoughts and ideas, a community was being formed there. In 2006, a fellow action shiro, Smita, Smita Jen, she proposed an idea. She said, let's do a blogathon on March 8th, 2006, inviting various bloggers to share their experiences of street harassment. This event, um, was, you know, so a small group uh, of uh, volunteers, action sheroes and heroes and deiros self-organized 
and reached out to various bloggers across the country. And um, it led to hundreds of testimonials of street harassment being shared on March 8th, 2006. The power of these narratives and personal testimonials, um, they traveled far and wide from various listservs, Google groups to mainstream media. People were recalling, women were recalling incidents that happened as recently as yesterday or all the way back to 30 years ago, but hadn't forgotten about it, had never spoken about it. They spoke about how it had shifted and altered their relationship with their cities and that they had just been calling it Eve teasing all this while. There was no vocabulary. Post the blogathon or with the blogathon, people started writing to us from different parts of the country. Um, and wanting to initiate this conversation where they lived. And there were, this led to blank noise chapters originating in different cities. And it was led by people, led by community. And what we noticed or began to notice was that suddenly there was a growing understanding and vocabulary of what constituted street harassment. It wasn't just teasing, but a phenomenon that had been trivialized and normalized and yet had affected and changed women's relationships with their cities and their public environments. I'm really pleased to add that INSEA here was one of the members who was part of you know, distilling what are the kinds of vocabularies that constitute street harassment. So I'd love to in invite INSEA to just uh, share something from her memory of that time period. Uh, yes, so what Jasmine is talking about was an opinion poll that we had uh, created. Uh, that opinion poll itself was eye-opening in many ways. It was created back in 2007 when, uh, you know, what we today term as microaggressions weren't commonly accepted. In fact, the tagline under the chart said, do you accept it because you expect it? Uh, so what the, what the uh, opinion poll involved was, it was a, a chart with uh, boxes and uh, you had to put thumb impression against uh, against all the boxes that you felt uh, constituted street sexual harassment. So you know there were some very um, very explicit uh, ter terms like you know uh, winking, staring at breasts, talking to breasts, etc. While there were some other things which can also pass, uh, which 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 are in, lie in the gray area. So there was one particular item which I particularly remember. Uh, it was adjusting the rear view mirror. So you know you had to say whether you thought that con constituted uh, street sexual harassment. Um, and now, of course, that had that had happened to me so often that uh, I promptly thumb printed it. Uh, but I remember uh, a fellow participant with me the, uh, uh, that day uh, asking me whether uh, that was something I really felt uncomfortable about. And that led to a conversation with her. And that's when we realized how come the idea of comfort is so individual and uh, that discomfort doesn't look the same for two people and how, uh, you know, negotiating that is a constant way to be in public. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Insia. And I also just want to add to that by saying that we, some, some of you may be wondering why is looking up there. Uh, some of you may be, so it wasn't, we weren't, we weren't trying to prescribe what is, but rather we were opening up conversations like Insia said. So let's talk about looking. Let's talk about how you're looking, not just looking itself. What is the tone of the gaze? And we wanted, we wanted to trigger conversation and this was an attempt for people to come put a thumbprint, start the conversation. And because we were building this, you know, while Insia and a larger gang was, or a team, was compiling these and, and sharing these and translating these, as you can see, it's in Bengali and English. Um, it was also being hosted somewhere. So this is Calcutta, Garya Heart Market, a tea stall owner, vendor, tea stall owner, uh, Namita Sharma would host it at her site and take agency as well and therefore also become an action shiro. Um, and this is, I'm just going to share this very, very briefly. This is something we did more recently uh, where we revisited this project and it's on, it's on Ashok Nagar and it's in English and Canada and it's become a wall publication and we hope to do any more of those. So I feel that when I look back, some of the practice also lends itself to toolkits then dissemination and, and furthering conversation uh, in, in, this, in this form. Um, so we continue to, we, uh, testimonials of street harassment 
took different forms. And here's a list of food names that women have been called on the street. Similarly, adjectives that women were called on the streets have also been archived and compiled. Songs women have been sung to on the streets. Um, you're welcome to, if there is something that you remember, whether it's from Museum of Street Weapons of Defense or from this list of food names and songs, you're very welcome to add to the comments or reach out to us and we'd like to revisit some of these projects. Denial and victim blame were at the center of the issue, and they continue to be, of course. Our project, the Night Action Plan, uh, responded to these notions of violence doesn't happen here. Violence happens to those women in those places, or um, you know, in those clothes at that time of the day. So those responses, or listening to these responses of street harassment, uh, led us to creating this Night Action Plan where we would get out late at night uh, we mobilized and we got out on the streets of Delhi and Bangalore, marking sites in Bangalore and Canada, Delhi in, 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 in Hindi, marking sites to say this happened here. And we wanted the city to literally wake up to the fact that it doesn't happen anywhere else. It happens in your presence. And we wanted to push the idea of collective responsibility and breaking denial through this. So this testimonial, it is fictitious and we created eight such fictitious, but of course we all know that fictitious but not fictitious characters. So this is Mohini, age 19, morning 8 a.m. Some a stranger rubbed himself against me. Similarly, there's Hasina, who's 24, Radha, who's 63, Pinky, who's nine, and it goes on. Um, so Blank Noise, is, Blank Noise is a community of action sheroes, heroes, deros, citizens, persons like you and me who are taking agency to end sexual and gender-based violence. We really believe that each and every person has the capacity, the potential, and power to influence a safe space. And being an action shero really means to be able to step into that power. Action sheroes at Blank Noise, and I will stay with action sheroes, but I, when I say action sheroes, I also include action heroes and deros, uh, are from across gender, uh, sexualities, age, cities, towns, and beyond, in India and beyond. Uh, Blank Noise designs interventions uh, to confront fear, shame, blame, and guilt. It, we build testimonies of sexual violence and disperse them back in the public to shift public consciousness. All of what I know, all of what Blank Noise is also built on is the lived experiences of its community. While Action Shiro's built Blank Noise, while it is really built on the collective labor and history or her story of its community, Blank Noise also builds Action Shiro's. The projects that we built are uh, inviting people to go beyond an idea of volunteering to really stepping in and, and sitting in with your truth and being uncomfortable and but, and confronting your own journey of fear, your own journey of perhaps bias even in understanding fear. Blank Noise is iterative. It's been a place of co-learning. What we discussed in 2003 to what we discussed today has been a sense of collective learning, collective and responding to critique over the years. Um, while Blank Noise was initiated on that note, while Blank Noise, and it takes the form of a public conversation, and while Blank Noise was initiated in response to street harassment, it has transitioned into being a collective that addresses attitudes that permeate spaces of violence, that is victim blame. Today, Blank Noise community, while we were built by the members of the public who stepped in, where I think our, our identity is much more fluid now, where um, the community isn't strictly limited by or defined by members of the public, but also feminist allies who collaborate with us and we build events together. Uh, and while I'm joined by three fellow action sheroes, I'd love to invite them to respond to what being an action shero means to you. Perhaps Abhaya can start. Yeah, to me, it means um, finding and creating solidarity with the action shero, dero, hero community. Uh, yeah, to me, it has meant learning what it means to be a woman out and about in public, as well as unlearning what it means to be a woman. It has meant uh, challenging the received wisdom uh, one is brought up on. So in that sense, it has been an inward journey as much as a public facing one. Um, for me, being an action hero also means um, holding space for myself and also others. Uh, to unlearn these inherent narratives of fear, blame, and shame, and to continuously challenge the status quo. 
thank you thank you so over the next few slides i'd like to take us through the journey of the action shiro and build on this identity what if so the action shiro identity has been built and shaped over the years through ongoing projects and interventions in the mid 2000s or in the early uh, from 2005 2006 we really asked the question what if i also just want to return to the point i shared earlier that half our practice at blank noise rests on listening to narratives and building narratives and listening into the narratives of sexual violence the other half rests on learning you know listening and then designing these actions or imagining these actions based on imagining imagining possible futures and designing the actions that uh, of of an ideal world or the or the place we desire to to be in um what if what if women were to stand idle in public the question what if led us to design these um interventions sorry i just have to um change the format slightly is venkat still here okay yeah okay um so the the question what if led us to design uh, designing these interventions um here you you know with the um, the question what if led to any uh, or out here in the i'm sorry in the photograph um, here you see any and we were designing this intervention called being idle where the premise was what if women were to be idle in public spaces what would the presence of an idle woman do to a public environment and what would being idle do to the action shiro um, who is present there how would it shift the nature of the place and how would it shift her how would this experience affect her memory uh, or affect the memory of uh, the body which has been trained and taught to grow up or or has been trained and taught to live in defense so action shiro's confronted fear action shiro's learned to unlearn fear and what we noticed was that whether it was one action shiro and this and this you know or a hundred action shiro's there would always be questions there would be questions such as why are you here are you waiting for someone are you um, and and there would be a, a line of people often waiting for something to happen so the sheer presence of an idle woman would raise questions about her role and purpose there in this photograph here you will see action shiro atre in delhi who she has a stack of papers in her hand and these are letters what we also did was convert the blogathon testimonials into letters addressing them to strangers saying dear stranger um and and sharing the experience of street harassment and also inviting the person to join the action and stand in solidarity i also wanted to add that the this this uh, these events being idle uh, started fostering friendships a lot of times people would show up um, and they wouldn't know each other but these events were where friendships started being formed um and um, over time action shiro's shared that um over time you know we were doing these events every weekend uh, in back in 2007 2008 and over time action shiro shared that they were experiencing change like uh, i'll never forget action shiro taronia saying i'm walking in the middle of the pavement now and i'm getting my space um and those responses inspired this text the step by step guide to unapologetic walking walk very very slowly um actually would me i invite somebody else to read this anyone from Uh, because i'm unable to move the you know the grid that's the problem i'm facing right now would somebody else would inse or ishita would you or anyone up higher would you like to read it because i might miss out a few words uh yeah okay i can read it walk very very slowly walk without your phone walk without your eyes fixed to the ground walk in the middle of the pavement walk with your chin a little raised walk without your bag 
walk without your sunglasses walk with your shoulders leaned back walk looking at passers by walk alone walk alone walk at 5 am 3 am 2 pm noon midnight 8 pm 3 pm walk humming a song walk whistling walk daydreaming walk smiling walk swinging your arms walk with a skip walk alone walk wearing your clothes walk wearing clothes you always wanted to but could not because you thought you might be asking for it walk without a dupatta walk without your arms folded walk without a clenched fist walk smiling walk smiling walk smiling thank you thank you insia um i think with with the text and um very often when we are presenting the uh, the this text in perhaps a college or in other spaces we are asked this question around can we really walk at 3 am um and i think that's where the um the conversation between imagining the ideal what is the reality we deserve and what is um and and can we step can we step back to imagine that reality what is the reality i deserve versus the reality i resist um and how do we step in to make that so this poem is more towards or this text is more towards imagining that ideal reality i'm not personally walking every day at 3 am i have done that but it's not my every day reality but i have a right to imagine that and i have a right to aspire to that and and to dream for that and to and in the power of collective action make that happen together and to and that we walk towards that new normal So again, earlier this year in um, Bangalore's Ashok Nagar, uh, we the Bangalore Police along with BBMP, um, the Karnataka State Commission for Women and Srishti, um, we we published this uh, we published this poem on a wall, and you can when whenever you can you can visit Ashok Nagar, and it's uh, along the wall really uh, that you walk it, uh, you read it while you're walking, and uh, it. it guides you through a walk so we again we hope to do more of these in 2008 we facilitated an event asking women to send in their wishes for their city and we were very struck by how simple these wishes were wishes included i wish to be able to walk humming a song I wish to be able to walk in the rain without worrying about my clothes wet, getting wet and somebody making me uncomfortable. And the next year, uh, a year after this event, a, a smaller group of us decided to um, make these wishes happen or claim our wishes. Um, it, this event gave me um, a moment also to not only facilitate but also desire. and i remember uh, dreaming and desiring uh, for a wish which really was uh, you know i'd love to be able to sleep in a park i'd love to be able to sleep in the open um so the next year i and saumya and um shreya uh, we went to kavan park and saumya sat under a tree challenging herself by reading a book alone Shreya and I decided to try and sleep, and we were at some distance, but but able to see each other. Um, and as I lay there, uh, equipped with my mat and a cushion, and as I almost went into sleep mode, I would wake up to a sound and realize it was just a leaf. And I was very very aware of the kind of threat that I carried on my shoulders and in my fist, and that that body was in defense. Um, again i would almost go back to sleep and wake up to a dog passing by and at that moment i lay there uh, just thinking about the about threat and fear about defense and fear and our story of fear that we are taught to fear and fear is um we receive stories of fear also to protect but also to control and uh, and is there bias in fear and i lay there imagining that there are more of us in fear of each other than with the actual intention to harm each other 
And how do we step into that? How do we step into the other part of the narrative of fear, which is that there are more of us, uh, there are, there are um, yeah, there are fewer people intending to harm. Um, and how do we start approaching what we do, not from a place of defense, but from a place of trust. And that's when I lay down, just um, imagining thousands of women sleeping in parks and wondered to myself, what would it do to a public space, a park or anywhere under the open sky to experience women sleeping? And what would it do to our bodies? And with this, I would like to pause here actually um, to really spotlight the climate of victim blame, which is very familiar to all of us, but through this project called Reporting to Remember, which Insya, Ishita, and Abhaya will share. So I'll have to stop sharing and then it's over to you. Nineteen seventy four, reporting to remember the Maharashtra Sessions Court judge who acquitted the men who raped Mathura by saying the rape was consensual because she was habituated to sex. Mathura is an Adivasi woman who was raped by police officers when she went to report her missing husband. We pledged to never forget Mathura. This led to the custodial rape law in India. I never ask for it. Nineteen ninety-five, reporting to remember the Rajasthan High Court judge who acquitted the men who raped Bhavri Devi by erasing the violence that was committed on her. The reasons given by the judge were: the village head cannot rape, men of different castes cannot participate in gang rape, elder men of sixty to seventy years cannot rape, a member of the higher caste cannot rape a lower caste woman because of reasons of purity. Bhavri Devi's husband couldn't have quietly watched his wife being gang raped. We pledged to never forget Bhabri Devi and her continued fight for justice. I never ask for it. 2005, reporting to remember the Nagpur police when they did not register complaints of the many women that were raped. Instead, the police victim blamed by calling them loose women and even accused one woman of being in an affair with the rapist. The rapist Akku Yadav was a member of a local gang and used his power to threaten and silence survivors. We pledged to not forget this injustice and Usha Narayane, a Dalit woman who defied his threats and led, to a, res and led a resistance. I never ask for it. 2008, reporting to remember the late Sheila Dixit, the then chief minister of Delhi, for her remarks in response to the murder of a woman journalist. Soumya Vishwanathan was murdered when she was out at night. Sheila Dixit said, one should not be so adventurous. We pledge to not forget. I never ask for it. 2012, reporting to remember Kakoli Ghosh Dastidar, an MP from Trinamool Congress, who said that gang rape of Suzette Jordan was not a rape, but, quote, a misunderstanding between a woman and her client, unquote. Reporting to remember Mamata Banerjee, the chief minister of West Bengal, who dismissed the rape of Suzette Jordan as, quote, a fabrication to, uh, created to malign her government. We pledge to never forget Suzette Jordan. I never ask for it. 2012, reporting to remember, the several persons in power who attempted to justify the rape and murder of Jyoti Singh Pandey through victim blame. Asaram Bapu, a self-proclaimed godman, she should have called the culprit's brothers and begged them to stop. Manohar Lal Sharma, a lawyer, said that he had never seen a respectable lady raped in India. Kailash Vijay Vargya, BJP leader, one has to abide by certain moral limits. If you cross this limit, you will be punished. Asha Mirje, then part of Maharashtra Women's Commission, 
Did Nirbhaya really have to go watch a movie at 11 in the night with her friend? We pledge to never forget Jyoti Singh Pandey. I never ask for it. In February 2020, groups of unidentified men forcefully entered a student fest and molested women students inside the Gargi College campus in Delhi. Sexual harassment at college fest was routine over the years. And when reported, the college administration dismissed the situation by saying that if they want to have fests, they must bear the consequences. The attitude of victim blame sparked a campus uprising. In August 2015, Jamia Millia Islamia University issued a notice to women students revoking their access of two late nights in a month and requiring women students to return to their hostels by 8 p.m. every day. Women hostel residents wrote an open letter to the vice chancellor calling out the discriminatory hostel rules. This inspired women students from Delhi University, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and Ambedkar University to unite, resist, and shift the patriarchal rules in colleges and universities across Delhi and India. This sparked the Pinjra Tor movement. In September 2018, women students at the Regional Institute of Education in Bhopal resisted against patriarchal hostel rules on their campus. The hostel curfew restricted women students with rules requiring them to be back in hostel no later than 6 p.m. Inspired by the Pinja Thor movement, women students mobilized, uh, challenged hostel rules, and demanded equal access to campus facilities. A month later, in October 2018, women residents of the Hoshiarpur Hostel, Punjab University, mobilized to write a letter to the vice chancellor listing concerns over the gender discriminatory hostel rules. According to the rules, women students were permitted to go out only five days a week and required to return by 7 p.m. The resistance is ongoing. In September 2017, three men assaulted a woman student on the Banaras Hindu University campus when she was on her way to, to in, when she was on her way back to her hostel. The student reported the incident to the hostel warden. She was victim blamed. She was accused of, quote, staying out late at night, unquote, therefore asking for it. Students demanded a safe campus and protested against moral policing, victim blame, and gendered hostel rules. I got a, I had a power cut, apologies. Um, okay, so one moment. Thank you, uh, thank you everyone for uh, waiting and uh, for the team to share the research. Um, and I think that, uh, sorry, I know my video has gone off, one moment. Thank you everyone again for your patience. Start my video. As, uh, as um, Abhaya, Insia and Ishita have shared uh, the research, the ongoing collaborative research project called Reporting to Remember and also the student led protest uh, up, you know, student uprisings in response to victim blame.
I think she's dropped off again. Just give us a second uh, while we sort this out. Apologies. Jasmine should be here in a minute. She just had a power outage, and so she's just signing back in. In the meantime, if, um, if members of the audience have any questions, please do feel free to drop them into the Q&A, um, or into the chat for that matter. Uh, or you can also use the raise hand option and such. Or if you also have experiences or con you know, reflections to share, please do put them so we can also have, have make this more of a dialogue and a discussion as well. Um, one of the reasons why we're doing this as part of the archives public lecture series is to, as I think it was mentioned in, uh, in the abstract that they had sent, which is uh, so much of what enters the archive is sort of through some formal structures. And, but there's always this question of where and how are narratives of negotiating silence and speech contained. Um, and a lot of the work that Blank Noise does sort of is, is a move in that direction. Um, so yeah, please, please do drop questions and uh, comments into the chat or the Q&A. Yes, I'm back and thank you everyone for patiently waiting. Sorry about that uh, between home, phone signal and internet all going off at the same time. Not the home yet, uh, but yes. Okay. Um, here we go. Yes, so again, thank you everyone for waiting and thank you to the to Insia, Bhaya and Ishita for sharing. Just wanted to very, very quickly touch upon that uh, we didn't actively contribute to any of those protests that were led by students, but we def and, and but it also allows us to imagine solidarities. Uh, it also allows us to, or we've I think the question also is that how does an art practice, where does an art practice come in in social service or public service? And, um, and what questions do we ask or what do we facilitate? Where do we imagine when we're not, um, yeah, what service is this? What, what service is the artist in public service or the art practice in public service? And, um, and yeah, but the research that uh, Ishita, Bhaya and Insia have shared, the Reporting to Remember project is an ongoing um, collaborative project uh, where we are archiving incidents of sexual violence that have been uh, justified through victim blame uh, and are living in our public memory. So it is a pledge to never forget. And, um, and also so the questions that we are asking through this is um, how does our personal narrative and our personal um, you know, how does the personal experience of shame and blame uh, in, in experiencing sexual assault, what is the relationship between the personal and the public and the public memory of shame and blame? Um, one of the questions, or I would say that back since 2003 to now, in the early, in between 2003 to perhaps 2005, 2008, the early years of blank noise, um, one of the questions that I would ask was to, you know, I wanted to hear and, and, and receive uh, testimonials of sexual violence. And I would get a varying set of responses. I would get responses such as, um, you know, how can you ask me a question like this? I'm not that type of woman. Or, um, or it would be, um, I want to talk to you. This happened to me and I was wearing my school uniform and it still happened to me. And I was wearing a uh, salwar kameez and it still happened to me. Uh, and I started noticing that women often referred to their clothes when they were talking about sexual violence. Um, that noticing became an inquiry and has now become a mission. If I were to ask you, and I would have asked you if we were doing this in in uh, in, um, in 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 live uh, in the physical environment, um, you know, the question always is: Do you remember the clothes you were wearing? when you experienced violence. And this is a question I've asked people in different 
parts of the country and different parts of the world too. And whenever I ask this question, women and girls remember. Um, the question is what makes us remember? I want to also again pause here to go back to 2012. 2012, uh, we learned of Jyoti Singh um, and we also learned of Suzette Jordan. And, um, and, especially, and after, you know, after and, and both these events were part of our public memory and, uh, and have been uh, in the, the victim blame associated with it. But, you know, 2012 really made us, um, made me think about um, what is, you know, the magnitude of the issue and our capacity and uh, also ask ourselves, um, you know, and, and also imagine, you know, the future, imagine solidarities and, uh, and work towards solidarities and also ask ourselves the question of, um, you know, how are spaces of violence interconnected? What is the relationship between what happens at home and what happens on the street and what happens at the workplace? And what is the role of victim blame across spaces? Um, and as you can see uh, from the reports that um, have been shared from reporting to remember, uh, you're hearing from the police, you're hearing from courtrooms, you're hearing also from the media. The, so the environment of victim blame has stopped survivors of violence from speaking about experiences of sexual assault. I never ask for it is um, a mission um, which invites women, persons, girls to bring that garment in that uh, they were wearing when they experienced violence. Your garment is memory, is witness and voice to your experience of sexual assault. What we're working towards is bringing 10,000 garment testimonials to India Gate or to a site of public significance by 2023 December. And I say 10,000 so that we can really um, make this a collective effort so that this can be about all women, not some women. And that it can, it, the only way it can be built is through a co-created process, through collaboration, uh, through a process that rests on um, saying I never ask for it, but also stepping back to hear somebody else say I never ask for it. It uh, rests on blank noise and allies designing processes and methodologies that are rooted in listening and empathy building. And behind the scenes, behind the building of these garment testimonials and receiving of these garment testimonials, we do workshops, we do uh, installations, and this is a short video uh, which will take you uh, through this. I should put on uh, uh, sharing. I know we're running slightly late. Venkat. Three layers, actually. Bring a pink spaghetti. Uh, Venkat, I think we're running slightly late. Are we okay on time? Hey, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So I will need about 12 minutes more. Would that be okay? Okay. Sure. Okay. So I will bring the audio of the computer audio. Okay. Three layers actually. A pink spaghetti, translucent pink shirt on top of it, pair of capris. Black uh, kurta and uh, red leggings. My white uniform, white skirt, white t-shirt. My far uncle was home and he was being inappropriate with me and he was being touchy with me. And of course I went to my mom, what else would a child do? She, the, her instant reaction was, she yelled at me, your stance, your behavior, all of that represents a person who wants attention from men. I really don't know how to talk to my parents because I thought I would be blamed for it. Uh, I used to wear burqa at that time. Though I was really very small, I started wearing leggings so that he doesn't see my legs.
Um, at this moment, I'd just like to invite Abhaya uh, because Abhaya has been part of, uh, like I said, there's been uh, the Unever Ask for It mission rests on several projects, one of them being what you saw here with the walk towards healing, uh, where we walk the streets of cities or stand in a college campus holding these garments, carrying these garments, carrying the weight, which is also inspired by another protest or another movement um, that, that has been about sharing responsibility, carrying the weight. So it is about carrying the responsibility, owning the responsibility and um, letting survivors know or making, you know, or believing survivors. And survivors, I say this in, you know, all of us have experienced uh, violence in some capacity or the other. So if we can, uh, you know, so that's, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm just saying that I'm not going to other anyone, but it is about all of us. And this is a conversation about all of us and those like us, those not like us and stepping in and stepping back. I'd love to invite Abhaya to just share a response uh, from her experience of uh, building a uh, walk towards healing. Uh, yeah, I think that just like you pointed out, it's simultaneously, it, it's showing solidarity while also healing for yourself because it's so, um, I mean, it's such a big part of us as women growing up and experiencing violence to be blamed and to have clothing associated with it. So it's both an act of solidarity as well as healing for yourself. And I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's very powerful because of that. And uh, Ishita and uh, Insia, would you like to add anything at all? If not, no worries. And if you would, please come in. Okay. Um, so thank you, thank you, Abhaya. Um, so yes, so I never asked for it is an ongoing mission, and uh, we'd love to hear from you uh, if you uh, if you'd like to be part of it or come build it uh, together. Um, I'm going to come back to I never ask for it, uh, but I'm going to took a little bit of a jump cut to um, back to meet to sleep. Um, so the idea or desiring and imagining thousands of women um, sleeping in the open and, and questioning or imagining what it would do to our bodies and, the, and, the, and our bodies' memories and also to a place and the memory of place, um, what would it do to that um, has uh, manifested or has uh, translated to a project called Meet to Sleep which is built in collaboration with uh, several feminist allies, organizations uh, across India, and also with girls at Habas in Pakistan. And, um, and this is ongoing. We build Meet to Sleep every year uh, on the 16th of December in memory of Jyoti Singh and all women and girls who've experienced violence. Um, I'm going to also quickly play um, Kamla Basin's video here. And uh, who championed the call to action in 2016 or 17? Hello, everyone. Actually, um, perhaps, well, perhaps we can you can see that video on on our website. And hello, everyone. Actually, Roshivali Desai. Let's meet on Saturday, 16 December, to a big movement. Let's join it and reclaim our rights on public spaces. Okay, so why are we getting this reason? 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 Because majorly, I tell you, in Mark, when we go alone, we don't feel comfortable. Either I have to take my brother to take my brother, or I have to tell my mother that I have to go to this park, 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 I need somebody. And I'm done with this bodyguard system. Now, I don't want to make any bodyguard. I had to make a public space for everyone. I made it for me. So I will reclaim my rights on Saturday and you guys too come and join me. Be there. Bye-bye. Okay, so this is the first time I've been here. On 16th of December, with deepest of sadness, we will remember Jyoti Singh and every girl, boy and woman who has been sexually harassed in public spaces. We'll go out into public spaces, lie in the sun, read or sleep to say goodbye to the fear inside. We will let the world know that India 
its streets, its roads, its parks belong to us women also. We'll tell everyone that in 1947, freedom came not just for Bharat, but also for Bharatis. Will you uh, do the same? Then go and lie in a park tomorrow and feel free. So today, Meet to Sleep is being built um, in collaboration with several organizations, with several uh, feminist networks who champion the call to action, just like you see in this video, Kamla Bhaseen has. And, uh, and they've been making this happen in different parts of the country, in rural India, in urban India. And uh, as an artist or as an arts practice, I'm interested in understanding, exploring, how does this idea speak to you? Why does this speak to you? And what are the solidarities that can be built and uh, both imagined and built in this process? Um, and so at this moment, we are actually uh, compiling and receiving responses and hope to publish a collective response of Meet to Sleep from 2014 to now. Uh, some of it is on the website, some of it isn't. Um, Meet to Sleep is, uh, or sleep really is a surrender and trust. And, and through Meet to Sleep, we are asserting the right to uh, not just live free from fear, but to be defenseless, to be in a state of defenselessness. And this is really claiming the words, I never ask for it. Just gonna take you through a few more images. This is Meet to Sleep at Ghantaghar in Lucknow with Sadhavna Trust. Um, this is Action Shiro Chrisel from Goa, who says, I must admit that the thought of not being in control in a public park petrifies me, and it is precisely because of that that I'd like to do this. Chrisel has also mobilized others in Goa to build Meet to Sleep. This is an Action Shiro uh, feminist ally, Vishnu, in Helsinki, who built Meet to Sleep uh, by herself in 2000, last year, 2019, December. This is Action Shiro Pahi, who did her a, a solo meet to sleep and uh, a few years ago, and she shares that I was in the park from 1.15 to 3.30 p.m. My heart was pounding as I entered. I picked up a spot and eased myself into lying down. Since I was absolutely alone, I took a book into bananas as my decoy. I put a leaf between the pages and held the book real close to my body and shut my eyes. Every rustle felt like someone had walked up to me and the wind felt like it was blowing away my sheet and my shirt and my skin was showing. All sounds around me were amplified. Action Shiro Pahi. So Meet to Sleep is an invitation to talk to your fear. It is to talk to your state of defenselessness and to be between that journey of defense and defenselessness, as you're right. Um, this is, a, uh, this is uh, these are members uh, of fellow action sheroes and allies from an organization called Anandi in Gujarat, who also incidentally celebrate 25 years of their practice today. Um, and uh, they built Meet to Sleep in uh, Gotra and Malia, and forget one more place. And after that, uh, they, um, you know, after the experience of Meet to Sleep, they went out and got themselves a cup of tea, but it also led to them forming a new collective called Jago Apni, which means my place. So they formed a collective on their right to public spaces after experiencing this, which, which is, um, yeah, which feels good. <laughs> um, I'd invite Ishita to take it from here with the map because Ishita has also designed this map. Um, so Meet to Sleep has been built um, from 2014 to 2019, and uh, it's been built with over 2,000 action sheroes. Uh, it's been built uh, across 89 parks in 38, or not just parks, but sites, open fields, and it's been built in 38 cities, towns, villages, which include uh, Muzaffarpur, Shorampur, um, Bangalore, of course, Ko Kochi, Chennai, um, also Jammu. Um, and uh, Pakistan, in Pakistan, Islamabad, Lahore, and Karachi. Um, and it's been built with over 49 organizational allies since 2014. Thank you, Ishita. And Ishita, on that note, would you also like to share a little bit of your experience of Meet to Sleep? Sure. So um, I've built Meet to Sleep three times in total, um, and I keep coming back, and I always will keep coming back. And uh, for me, 
uh, whether it has been two of us or whether it has been 20 of us, when we lay down together under the open sky, um, slowly but surely we let go of our defenses. And when we wake up, um, feeling not only refreshed, but also feeling invincible. And that is a magical feeling that I undoubtedly hold, um, I keep, I hold on to um, throughout my life and will continue to do so. And that to me, that for, that for me, that's why I need to sleep is um, really about experiencing the power of collective imagination and to be able to imagine, uh, collectively imagine a space where we can all just be fearless and defenseless. Thank you, Ishita. And um, yeah, and talking of collective, it really, I mean, Ishita too has in another conversation shared, and I'm also thinking of Shruti Chandrasekhar, another action hero, who speaks of, who was part of Need to Sleep one year, and the next year she came in to offer herself as a safe space to another person as an action, as a fellow action hero. She said, my presence made, I stepped in with my presence and lay there so that you could also feel safe. So this safety network or the safety solidarity action shiro feminist ally network is what this rests on. And this is the invitation for all of us in any capacity to be that action shiro, hero, dero, and to really, again, I use the word imagine deliberately here to imagine what our individual and collective potential capacity really is in creating safe spaces, in, in uh, stepping in as an ally, to question the word ally, to question the word solidarity, and what is the starting point of that word. One more video, and I'll close after this. This is um, Sakina Parveen, and she is from Shorampur. And I will translate it because it's very brief. It's in, it's in Hindi. नाम क्या है मेरा नाम सकीना परवीन है कहां रहती हैं मैं जानीपुर जानीपुर मुड़िया चक में रहती हूं और आप जब सोई थी यहां पे दो घंटे तो आपको क्या महसूस हुआ मैं कभी एक गांव से इतनी दूर के फील्ड में कभी नहीं सोई हूं पर आज मैं सोई हूं इसके इससे मुझे लग रहा है जैसे आसमान में चिड़ियां उड़ते हैं खुले जगह खुले आसमान में वैसा ही मुझे भी महसूस हो रहा था मैं अपने आप को आजादी महसूस कर रही थी और मैं आज कभी कहीं भी गांव से दूर आकर कभी नहीं सोई हूं पर आज मैं ग्राउंड में दो घंटे सोई हूं इसके लिए मुझे आजादी आई फेल्ट लाइक अ फ्री बर्ड इन द स्काई आई हैवंट एवर कम दिस फार फ्रॉम माय विलेज एंड टुडे आई स्लेप्ट इन द ग्राउंड आई नेवर स्लेप्ट इन द ओपन ग्राउंड लाइक दिस आई स्लेप्ट इन द ग्राउंड फॉर 2 आवर्स एंड आई फील लाइक अ फ्री बर्ड इन द स्काई आई हैव एक्सपीरियंस्ड फ्रीडम This is girls at Dhabas in Islamabad who built Meet to Sleep as well. Actually, this is the last slide. Uh, this is Action Shiro Fiji and her amazing Action Shiro daughter Nia. Um, after the Meet to Sleep in Bangalore, um, there's you know we we have a gathering. We discuss things like could you sleep? I couldn't sleep. I slept on my stomach. I Cold. We also have guidelines like if you want to sleep next to someone and if somebody's okay with that. So we there's no one-time formula, but we invite people to address their fear, to be in touch with their fear, to make choices based on fear, to offer each other support based on who's you know based on uh, being able to check in how different people in the in the group are feeling. So after the event, uh, the group gathered and spoke about their experience of sleep or lack of sleep. Um, and at that moment, uh, and this we know because Viji sent it to us, um, Nia said, you know, she, she didn't, she said, why are people talking, why are these adults talking about sleep? What is the big deal about sleep? And, and, th and that uh, place where, you know, and that, that was really um, powerful because for a child, that should be the normal and that should be the normal that we can walk towards. And, uh, we can sleep towards perhaps, but yeah, we can walk towards or, or, or aspire for. Um, yeah, and um, and I'd like to just close with this, that it would be fairly dangerous if this idea of imagining rests on one type of imagination alone. Um, and so how do we really, um, you know, question the idea of um, you know, how can, can we step in or step back to facilitate processes or be part of one that includes, that includes an imagi uh, imagination uh, beyond our own? 
And another question that uh, we're thinking about is can a, resist can a resistance of defense uh, alone bring change? And so resistance rooted in saying no uh, is not enough. In saying I never ask for it too, it's not enough. What do I ask for? Uh, what do I dream of? And as for, for us to go beyond uh, what we are forced to firefight is really the call to action. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Jasmine and Sia, Ishita and Abhaya. There's, there's a whole range of questions that have come up. Uh, how would you like me to go about this? Would you like me to just relay them out to you? There's a couple that have also come in from YouTube. Should sure. I just relay them out to you or do, or do you want to sort of pick from the questions that have come? I mean, what would you like to do? Uh, uh, okay, so there is there are, maybe you can read them out because- Okay, so I'll, I'll so I'll, I'll start off with one, a uh, couple of questions that came in from YouTube and I think it, it sort of jumps off from where you just left off. And this is from Vanshika who, well, one was a practical question, which is what are the ways in which people can join Blank Noise or any of its campaigns? Um, and the second is perhaps, you know, as you said, you know, about whose imagination? And um, Vanshika asks, can our narrative go past justifying that we didn't ask for it and rather be, um, uh, around how dare you, or bring in practical changes like making self-defense an essential weapon of um, every woman's arsenal. Uh, could you just elaborate a little bit more on the sort of conversation that you just started on whose imagination of going beyond the I never ask for it uh, narrative? Yeah, I think in terms of I never ask for it, yes, uh, perhaps at a very, um, the vocabulary itself is saying I never ask for it. And what, but the tone in which we work with building, I never ask for it, is never ever, perhaps that's how we started because we recognized that, oh, it's not the clothes. Why do women remember the clothes? And that kind of realization and then defending. And now we're saying we're no longer going to defend. I never ask for it. And yes, uh, in Hindi, actually, when I think of what would I never ask for it translate at, translate as in Hindi, I often say, or to me it often is khabardar, which is don't you dare. Uh, so thank you for that note. But um, with with I never ask for it, it is already in the way it's being designed and the way it's, we, work, we work with it, it is already beyond defense because I never ask for it is with a meet to sleep. I never ask for it and meet to sleep, talk to each other. Um, meet to sleep would not have happened without I never ask for it. So I see it in kind of a totality. And uh, so, and yeah, so that's, um, and, and yeah, and I never ask for it builds processes and methodologies that are rooted in empathy building, listening. Um, again, Abhaya has been part of listening circles as has Ishita. So if you'd like to step in to share what listening circles offer, um, you know, and what we're really working on, this is again, please, please respond. Ishita or Abhaya, Abhaya yeah. I know I was going to ask Ishita, but yeah, um, I think listening circles are, again, I think it, it's as much about the self as it is about a community and showing up for your community. And I think, again, the listening circle really is that, you know, you have a space to uh, speak about your own experiences and, you know, speaking itself is such a powerful act. Um, like there were so many things that I didn't even realize that I was holding um, and I was able to let go of that in that listening circle because I knew that everybody there would support me and not judge me. Um, and once it starts, I think everyone kind of feels the same way and they're all speaking. And so I think Ishita mentioned this before, but you're holding space for others and for yourself. And um, yeah. Thanks, Amaya. Ishita, you want to add? Yeah, I mean... Um... For me, if I were to say personally, when I was when I attended my first listening circle, I remember um, when you know Jasmine asked me if I had ever experienced um, sexual harassment or any form of sexual harassment. I said no, and when I came to the listening circle, it was really a process of remembering as well. When I heard someone else speak about it, it was sort of triggering memory, and in that process of sharing, I also. Uh, you know, acknowledge that this happened to me. And I also remember speaking about shame and it was, it, it and just automatically it was about letting go of that shame. And um, yeah, and, and that was a really important process for me. And that's what the listening circle space 
sort of offered me and I believe also offers anyone who's part of that circle. Thanks. And Insia, do you want to add? I know you haven't been part of a listening circle, but if you feel like adding, please do. Or else I'm happy to respond to the part of whose imagination. And I think that being conscious of it, I think in 2003, that reality that of bodies beyond my own was not, you know, was not part of my imagination then, but now it is. And it's 17 years of that uh, responding to these questions that have shaped it and being built. And, and, and so when we're talking about the way to uh, protect the word, the right to imagination from being a singular one is and a dangerously singular one is uh, through a facilitated process and through collaborations. Um, so, and that's really what we want. I never ask for it and need to sleep to, to do. And that's the offering uh, in public service as an artist that we're not coming in or an art practice. We're not coming in with offering solutions, but we're coming in to facilitate collaborations, processes. We may not have the capacity to do crisis intervention, for instance, but we come in with questions, with, with, uh, with listening, with building tools, designing tools, um, and, and facilitating processes so that it cannot uh, or it does not um, dangerously go into a singular narrative of, or a singular imaginary or a singular imagination. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm going to couple of, uh, I'm going to couple two different questions that I see. There's one from an anonymous attendee who'd asked about how blank noise may judge success or impact or are there ways in which one can see incidents of harassment becoming rarer? But I also maybe, so just something for you to think about, but uh, there's also a person in the audience, I believe Sahana, um, Sahana, you're in a position to just ask your question. And this was around uh, opposition to the ideas. Um, Sahana, if you could go ahead and try and speak it out, that'll be great. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Um, so my uh, question was, uh, I asked this when you were reciting the uh, Walk Alone poem, and you mentioned that uh, there were people questioning how viable it is for a, a girl to really walk at 3 a.m. So I was wondering if you've ever, other than the questioning of these, of your ideas, the viability of us. Have you ever received any right ideas to propagate through the system? And uh, how do you deal with such instances? Like, how do you deal with, how do you uh, convince a non-feminist uh, that these are ideas to be propagated and uh, uh, women, <laughs> at the crux of it, that women uh, have the right to walk at 3 a.m. in the night if they wish to? Um, yeah, so again, thank you, Shahana. I heard bits of it, but I think I got the gist of it. Okay. Um, I'm not sure of, I mean, I'm not sure if we see, I mean, I'm not sure if we're out to convince, but we're out to question and to, um, yeah, I, uh, I think that who are we questioning or how are we collectively questioning? How are we building conversation together? So the invitation always is, to step in and be a little uncomfortable and ask questions and, um, and, and to build projects based on that. And those projects may re receive, uh, they may spark the imagination of someone else and they may do it too. But um, yeah, and I think like feel um, early on, like maybe yeah, when we started out in 2003, one of my professors, uh, he said uh, that, um, you know, you may be able to work with those on the fence uh, and you may be, you know, and so you have to choose who you want to engage with. And uh, so for those who are allies are allies and there is solidarity. And then there are those on the fence who just need that little nudge or a call in. And that's what, that's what we do. We're, we're talking to those who are bystanders but could have been witnesses and are leaning towards being a witness. We're talking to, uh, to, to those who, um, you know, we're, we're trying to find and build language which will find that person on the fence to come in. And, and, and you know, the more that jump over the fence will perhaps speak to the ones across the fence. Um, so that's really how I think we function. 
Um, and um, I'm sure there have been people who thought it's ridiculous uh, to, uh, you know, say, oh, well, how can you walk at 3 a.m.? And sure enough, it is ridiculous and why not be ridiculous? So, um, you know, and in the sense that we have a right to imagine the ideal, that ideal we deserve rather than constantly having to uh, firefight and define and limit ourselves by what we have to firefight. So I'm asking, inviting that we leap towards what should be possible rather than what is possible. And that is a luxury, but if we, it may be seen as a luxury rather than is a luxury. It may be seen as a luxury, but if, can we try and position the right to imagine as a right and not, not something that only select people do, which also goes back to the earlier question. Thank you, you know, so much. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. There is uh, a question that came up very early on, I think, uh, when you showed one of the slides from Ashok Nagar, Jasmine, and this is from uh, from Mauna, and I'm just going to see if she can go ahead and ask her question directly to you. Is this on YouTube? No. Uh, no, it's in the question section here. Uh, but Mauna, you're unmuted. Could you? Yeah, could you I'm ask? here. I'm here, Venkat. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah. Well, uh, well, uh, well. Honestly speaking, uh, well, I'm I'm a part of the NCBS community. I work there, and you know, and I also attend the, some of the archive talks. Um, well, blank. I mean, I am from Bangalore, and I've I've been uh, hearing about uh, blank noise being a movement, sort of, or rather, a collective um, for for um, against gender harassment, rather since. Uh, maybe since a decade or something. But yeah, one of the questions that, I mean, one of, I wouldn't term it as a question, it's more of an observation. When you showed the, you know, it's, it's the, the sort of a questionnaire that you had it on the a wall in Ashoknagar. And um, I realized that uh, some men had also responded on it. And I was surprised by it. Considering the, I mean, um, but my surprise does not indicate that men or boys don't undergo gender harassment, but it's more surprising. It's, it, it's a little surprising that way. Uh, because uh, it's, it's mostly women who undergo and, uh, and, and it's only now that they've been open about it. And for men to be open about it, I guess that's what's surprising me. Thank I'm you. done, Venkat. Thank you. I'd also, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to just, uh, I see Samira here, Samira Khan from Y Loiter. And for some reason, I missed mentioning them in uh, Meet to Sleep and, and other collaborations. But hi, Samira. May I read out what Samira has shared? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, Samira. Could we, let, uh, we can let Samira speak. I mean, we'll just uh, get her into the conversation if she is willing to do so. Uh, Samira, if you Hi, can. Yeah, yeah, I am here. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Jasmine, everyone. Blank noise. Very happy to be here. So I just was sharing an idea saying, with Jasmine, that, that the common idea shared by blank noise and us at Y Loiter, uh, and that's why we've collaborated so well in the past, is about imagining. And I really, I'm glad she brought up the idea of imagining a different more inclusive city, public space, nation, world, uh, which is uh, imagined by women and for women and all other unbelongers to this public space, uh, not just women, the, un the unbelongers were also not women, and pushing this idea in different diverse ways. Uh, so, uh, and it's so very important to move beyond this idea of public space just being associated with danger and safety, and unsafety, and to engage with pleasure in public space. I mean, this is an idea Weilauta has, and I know it's shared by Blank Noise, and that's the reason we sort of work well together. Together, um, and to applaud Blank Noise in its initiatives. Uh, I've known Jasmine for a long time, she's been Shristi. So it's um, a pleasure hearing her speak about this. Thank you. Thank you, Samira, and thank you for being here. Um, there are a few questions uh, that have come around. Um, well, I mean, since this question that Mauna brought up around uh, what she noticed in the Ashok Nagar, I was. I noticed a couple of questions on the YouTube conversation where uh, someone had asked what, uh, I'm just going to quote it verbatim uh, to the extent that I can. It says, what is the boundary with respect to commenting on women being attractive? What would be the vocabulary you advise to men in this respect? Uh, and I guess it's a broader question on education um, and how do you sort of uh, 
and that's what they're asking is it important to educate people about this and there's, there's a follow up comment from another listener there saying it's great that someone is asking for guidance on vocabulary because there'll be a chance for one to deny it and such so is this something that you want to just touch upon um, any of you yeah we okay anyone else in sia vishita abaya uh, i mean you you can begin i can add in okay yeah um yeah so i just say welcome in and uh, let's uh, you know we uh, we've done one pilot on our project which brings uh, 21 men and seven women into a room uh, to discuss an aspect of masculinity and uh, we hope to be doing more of those but i'd say welcome in and thank you for the question of course uh, yeah and i'd leave it at that because this is uh, uh, fairly um, yeah it's it's a large um, Uh, it's yeah it's another room to get into but, at, but again thank you for your question and i really appreciate you asking the question so that yeah and abhaya you want to add to that yeah i mean i i think this was a question i used to get a lot because i used to work in the prevention of sexual harassment and whenever i'd go to a workplace this was always a question i'd get is um how do i compliment my colleague now i'm scared to compliment my colleague um and like just means that this is a larger question but i think Uh, the important thing to remember is respect and how you're positioning a statement you know someone can say you're looking nice and then they they can look you up and down and say you're looking nice so is there a respectful tone uh, are you demeaning the person or are you genuinely complimenting them and i think most people uh, both have the ability to notice when someone feels uncomfortable um as well as express you know when someone is responding in a negative manner so i think it's just being conscious of other people's boundaries and also making sure you're respectful in even the way you compliment someone thanks uh just when you brought up the point about sorry go ahead i just wanted to go back to the person that we really mean it like welcome in because this is a conversation to be had and blank noise is a place of co-learning and facilitating conversations so really truly welcome in and uh, we look forward to hearing from you uh one of the uh, questions that has come up and i think this is something that you might have touched upon briefly which is uh thinking about folks who are not able to share stories uh perhaps people outside of urban spaces as they said or people from um quote extra extremely marginalized backgrounds who are still silenced so i guess this is broader question of how does how do you see this going forward in terms of capturing different kinds of memories from more diverse um, set of people yeah that that really is a, this. thank you uh, thank you to the person who asked that question that is the kind of consciousness that we are working with in building i never asked for it that's what's happening in a very uh you know the vision has grown from recognizing that women remember the clothes to where it is at now that it rests on collaborations it rests on um you know the yeah and um yeah that it rests on those collaborations and that's a need to sleep has been um a way to also um kick start some of these conversations and and collaborations within the the larger feminist movement um so yeah so that would i hope that answers your question because it is definitely something that we are conscious of um and um and and we want to work towards so that i never ask for it and the work we do uh is uh yeah is built in conversation with in, and through facilitated process in collaboration with um yeah with different communities with different allies um who are uh, yeah so the question really is uh who does this speak to and why and that's that's the inquiry and that's what need to sleep uh you know as an art, as an artist that's what we i'm taking forward or as an art collective that's what we're taking forward that who does it speak to does need to sleep uh speak to you uh and why and and how do you make it your own so that's the inquiry for both um the understand both responding to victim blame and um and also the idea of um whose imagination we are far from actually i mean not far from but uh but yeah so the, 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 sort of um, that's the vision and now we're slowly uh, walking our way towards it yeah okay. we'll wrap up with two questions i mean one 
that's very quick. This was uh, again from someone anonymous who'd asked, uh, who's your youngest participant been in the Meet to Sleep programs? Just, I guess I'm also curious. I think we have to return to Y. Loiter. <laughs> Shilpa, Shilpa, Samira, how old would Shilpa's daughter have been then? She would have, uh, sorry, Samira, how old would have, uh, uh, I think she would have been seven or five, right? Yeah, I know that uh, Shilpa Phatke's daughter, Shilpa Phatke of Y. Loiter, her daughter uh, also participated in Meet to Sleep, as did Shilpa Phatke's mother. So it was uh, three generations, and uh, I think she was about five or six. And then there's Nia, who's seven or eight. But in terms Hello, of... Sir. I wanted to just add that in terms of our interns, we've had this year, two of our interns were 16 years old. So. I'm sorry, I think that, that was one question that was left off in the beginning about um, how does someone get in touch if they want to collaborate or partner or volunteer with Blanknoise? You can just uh, email us at actionhero at blanknoise.org. We can mail you the details. Maybe we can just put that email address in the chat window for everyone. Put it in, okay, right. I can put it in here. And we'll, uh, yeah, you can probably put it in the chat or something. Uh, oh yeah, in, into your slides as well, of course. The, I guess one last question, which I guess is pertains to a broader conversation. You know, I noticed in some of your slides, you talked about partners in different parts of the world. And this is a question that came from Jeremy, whom I presume you know, um, but unfortunately, might have already left the conversation at this point. But the question was, how are you finding connections with other parts of the country and also internationally? Do you have alignments or collaborations with other activists and artists? Uh, but maybe there's a broader question here about how do you see these kind of movements being played out in different parts of the world? Uh, you talked about solidarity as being something that's very focal, you know, um, important in this conversation. So could we? Talk about that path forward in how your connections are. Um, what other conversations around this right to imagine are there out there? Um, in terms of solidarities, um, I'm using that word in, sorry, just one moment. Um, yeah, in, so I, where we are at with this is recognizing and mapping uh, the fact that victim, there's resistance to victim blame in different parts of the world and in, in our country too. And uh, we are currently researching, uh, we've uh, researching this and, and then envisioning what the solidarities could be like. So it's, I would say still early stages, but that's, um, again, it's with the idea of who does this speak to and why, and how do we have the conversation? So it's also then about having the capacity to, uh, so right now a lot of our work at uh, blank noise is around capacity building, team building. Everyone has been a volunteer except Ishita who is transitioning out and Abhaya who's transitioning in. <laughs> so, um, so yes, so there's a lot, there's a lot to be, a lot to be done on that front towards this purpose. And that's what we're working on. But the research project, we had two interns last year who uh, looked at uh, global uh, resistance in, in the form of uh, hashtags uh, on, um, it, you know, led by led by feminist groups across the world. So there is a project which hasn't been consolidated, but we have several hashtags researched, which are uh, a, a documentation of uh, feminist resistance in different parts of the world. And it is all towards this larger goal of how do we imagine solidarity, but also side, you know, alongside. Uh, build capacity to be able to have those solidarities and and uh, manage those solidarities as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, just wanted to say thank you to all of you for your for your time, patience, and actually putting putting this work together. This is quite fantastic. And uh, thanks to the audience. Uh, if you guys don't mind, what we will do is um, we'll wait for the silence to reduce the plan. But uh, what we can do is we will stop the live sort of streaming sort of section and just open it out to a more informal conversation with the audience if anyone wants to just have a chat for the next 10 to 15 minutes. Would that be okay with all of you? That works for me. Yeah, and of course, you're welcome to leave whenever you want. But uh, we'll sort of formally close the this particular public lecture uh, section now.
And uh, thanks so much to everyone who's joined us for this conversation. And uh, hopefully we'll have, we'll see you in July for the next, for the 27th edition. So um, for now, thanks so much for coming here. And uh, Chandrakant, we can probably just stop the, the recording and the,